Have you got the fatigue briefing now? Yes. Okay. You can see it. I appreciate yeah. it. So thank you very much. Tonight we are going to talk about fatigue in the pilot. And before we start, um, I want to give my uh, obligatory disclaimer. Uh, these opinions are my own, and they do not reflect those of the United States Air Force or any other uh, federal organization. Um, I will tell you that <clears throat> when you do a Class A investigation, which is an investigation of an aircraft loss that is either a loss of life or a loss of over $1 million worth of damage, um, there are several um, caveats, one of which is that we, we may never actually discuss the name of the lost individual, or I can't even say which base uh, it came from. So when you see this, all of the pictures that I have in this briefing, I stole, <laughs> blatantly stole from the internet, and none of them would have anything to do with the actual uh, aircraft uh, that would I be identifying that aircraft or that base or that unit. So I need to make sure that, that you understand that. So we're going to talk about uh, fatigue and the pilot, but we're going to do it based on one of the two F-16 Class A's that I investigated. These, uh, when, there is an when there is a loss, we have two boards that meet. First is the Safety Investigation Board, which has to start literally immediately. And the Safety Investigation Board is uh, generated. And the idea of the Safety Investigation Board is to quickly, within about six weeks or so, make sure that there was no overarching safety issue that would cause us to ground the fleet, um, or that could allow us to give an, in, uh, an instruction across the fleet so that that uh, issue would never occur again. Following the Safety Investigation Board is the Accident Investigation Board. And so in both cases, I was on the Safety Investigation Board, and we're going to base this talk on one of those uh, briefings. So let's see. Um, let's talk about the accident. On 8.30, 0830 hours on mis mishap day, shark flight, which was not actually the name of the flight, of four F-16s took off from what I'm going to call ABC Air Reserve Base. The mishap pilot, MP stands for mishap pilot, was an aircraft number three. He was the second. Uh, he was the lead of the second element. So aircraft one, aircraft two were the first element, and aircrafts three and four were the second element. Second element was in trail and to the right of the first element. The plan was a low-level ground attack with ingress to the range at 150 feet uh, above uh, ground level. Action, you can see what was supposed to happen, action to the right, move into trail, action to the left, pop up to 2,500 feet AGL, dive onto the target, bomb release at 250 feet AGL, action left and climb to 5,000 and egress the range. So that was the plan. And let me uh, make this work. For some reason, my animation, which was working just a moment ago when we tested it, is not working now. I'm going to minimize this and see if that makes a difference. It does not. Well, I'm hoping that the others will work. Um, in the morning, that morning, the morning of the mishap in the squadron, the mishap pilot signed in at 0652 hours. He was scheduled to fly both a morning and an afternoon mission. The interesting thing was that he'd called the squadron the day before and said that he had to cancel flying the morning mission. And when they asked him why, he said he didn't give a reason. He would not give a reason. He simply said, I won't be able to fly it. The director of operations, the DO, approached Mishap Pilot that morning and said, look, you know, we're going to have to scrub this whole thing. We don't have another pilot that can step into your place. So the other three pilots are going to lose their training flight if you have to cancel. And says why, and asked, why did you cancel? And the mishap pilot wouldn't answer. So the DO asked him directly, are you rested and are you within regs? 
Mishap Pilot said yes. And so then Mishap Pilot said, look, I don't have any excuse. Um, I can fly the mission. And he would not explain his earlier cancellation. During the mission briefing, that was considered a standard briefing. All the pilots uh, had flown this mission before. They all knew each other. This was a, a reserve uh, unit. So the, these guys had been together for years. They knew each other. The other guys on the flight said uh, they, that mishap pilot was not his usual jovial self. They, they noticed that he did not take notes. He didn't draw an attack diagram for his kneeboard. He didn't ask any questions, but no one was very concerned about this because everybody had flown this mission before. In the locker room and in walking out to the jet, uh, nothing unusual was noted. Mishap Pilot was noted to drink some water before leaving the locker room, stay hydrated. In the last chance area, nothing unusual was noted. So I want to just stop for a second and explain what is the last chance area. Uh, when we taxi out, and we've done all the pre-flights and we're set to go and we taxi out. Before we get to the uh, runway, we stop at the last chance area. And there a crew chief does a last walk around of the aircraft and there's a last um, checklist, the last chance before we uh, launch the mission. I don't know uh, if you guys do this, but I do this with every flight. Uh, I do my pre-flight, I push out of the hangar, and then I have a last chance walk around. I act as if I am my crew chief, uh, my own crew chief, and do a last chance walk around, which is a different, a different look than my normal pre-flight. Um, it's very helpful, and it's um, something that I strongly recommend. If you do not incorporate that, I, I strongly recommend it. In any case, the last chance area uh, look was uh, nothing. Nothing was unusual. So the mission launched. On ingress, very interestingly, the mishap pilot made several air-to-air -air calls, which were completely ignored by the rest of the flight. Uh, he was looking down at his radar, and he was calling bogeys. And he was literally, he would, they're, you know, they're flying at 150 feet above the ground, and he's calling bogeys at 23,000 feet, 35,000 feet. He's calling airliners that are showing up on his uh, radar. It was distracting to the rest of the flight. And it was thought by the rest of the flight that he was literally distracting himself by calling these extraneous bogeys that had nothing to do uh, with the immediate safety of this flight. The other three uh, pilots actually later described, it appeared as if he was actually trying to be the mission lead uh, instead of flying um, mission wing three uh, position. Also noted he did not trail at his prescribed distance. When it was time to action right and left, uh, he turned at an incorrect time and used an incorrect bearing. And he actually made one of these extraneous bogey at 35,000 feet calls five seconds prior to one of his incorrect actions. And so there was some question in the in the minds of the other pilots uh, as he was doing the ingress. On the attack run, he released his ordinance earlier than briefed. And after the ordinance was released, he turned inside Mission Lead's ground track. Now he was supposed to be trailing. And instead of trailing, he turned inside Mission Lead's ground track. On climb out, he made a climbing left turn after his ordinance was released. Uh, he began to roll out of his left bank at 2,600 feet AGL, and then made a sudden sharp diving left bank and impacted the ground, losing his life and destroying the aircraft. <clears throat> now, on a, in a safety investigation brief, there are several prescribed persons that have to be on the safety investigation. Everyone has to have experience with the F-16. That's the first. And one of the persons is called the pilot investigator. And the pilot investigator's job is to take the black box once it is recovered and go back to the factory and fly the mission over and over and over again to see what happened from the pilot's perspective. And when we did um, find the black box, 
and our pilot investigator went back to the factory and put it in the sim, which really recreates the entire flight. <clears throat> he said that when the mishap pilot began to roll out of his left bank at 2,600 feet, because he had turned inside mission lead, mission wing two, the second aircraft in the, in the flight, was right in his peripheral vision. Instead of being in trail, he was, he was literally right beside mission wing two. And in his peripheral vision, it would have looked as if he were about to have a midair. And it caused our investigating pilot to recreate the accident. He literally startled himself and crashed the sim in exactly the same way that the mishap pilot uh, lost his life in the real world. Uh, pretty scary for the investigating pilot. And in fact, he flew the mission over and over and over again. He said on his 17th time of flying it, even though he knew what was going to happen, he crashed and burned 16 times. And on his 17th time, he found a way out of it. But it was so unusual that no one would ever in the real world have done the, the maneuver that he did in order to roll out. And you had to know that the Mission Wing 2 aircraft was where it was. So that you know, the reality was that because Mishap Pilot was not in the right place, uh, this was an accident that was virtually unavoidable. So here's, let's, I, well, I hope this is going to work now. This is what was supposed to have happened. Here's mission lead, mission wing two. Here's the mishap pilot. And they're, they're going to fly in, go into trail, bomb release, and then egress. That's what was supposed to happen. Right, right action, left action, climb, dive bomb, climb out, and egress. Now I removed mission wing four uh, from this for clarity. And let me show you what really happened. Mishap pilot is not trailing where he's supposed to be. He's too close. He releases his bomb early, he turns inside, bang, he pulls out, sees mission wing two, thinks he's going to impact with mission wing two, so he jerks to the left and impacts the ground. Uh, let me show that again. Here's the action right in the wrong place. He's too close, action left, climb, release his bomb early, turn inside, and as he rolled out, there was mission wing two in his peripheral vision, and he jerks and uh, loses his life. Now, at the time of the avoidance maneuver, he was traveling at 520 knots in a climbing left turn at 2,600 feet, that's 87, 877 feet per second, which is faster than a 45 caliber bullet, which travels at 800 feet per second. Time to the ground from 2,600 feet at that speed is 2.96 seconds, so less than three seconds, which is not a lot of time to make a decision to pull the handles and eject. Although the pilot tried, in those under three seconds, he did reach down, he grabbed the handles, he pulled the handles. Unfortunately, he was so low and he had such little time. The ACES 2, which gives you a 20 G acceleration up the rails in order to get you out of the aircraft, the ACES 2 moved less than one inch on the rail before the aircraft impacted the ground. To give you an idea, just for comparison, uh, that how fast he was going at that low altitude. He was traveling 877 feet per second, time to the ground from 1,000 feet, which is pattern altitude. I, I just made pattern altitude as a, as a comparison, is only 1.14 seconds. A, a bullet takes a minute and a quarter seconds, 
a narrow star, almost three seconds, velocity a little over four seconds at 172, five seconds. So he's going pretty darn fast. And uh, his, his time to, uh, from the uh, accident altitude to the ground was less than three seconds, which is a very short time to make a decision. So let's look at the mishap pilot's data, which is part of what we have to do when we do our safety investigation. The mishap pilot was a 37-year-old married Caucasian male. In this, he was a reservist. In his civilian uh, life, he was an airline check flight engineer. Uh, he was an instructor pilot in the US Air Force Reserve. He had over 2,000 uh, hours in the F-16. And he was a weapons school graduate. For those of you who've not uh, been on active duty uh, or not been in the, in the military flight regime, um, uh, a select, a select number of pilots, a very limited select number of pilots who are really hot sticks are sent to the weapons school for truly um, advanced training. It's uh, the Air Force equivalent of the Navy's Top Gun. Uh, again, that is all a very select group of pilots. And he was a graduate of the weapons school. So he was a very, very good pilot. His human factors review, we have a list of human factors that we have to check as the investigating flight surgeon. <coughs> Starting with his medical history. He had a G-induced loss of consciousness, G-lock, G-induced loss of consciousness, uh, two years prior to the mishap flight. Now, um, if you pull too many Gs in the aircraft, you don't have enough blood going to your brain, uh, you lose consciousness. Uh, this is a pilot in the centrifuge, and they're going to spin him up. And I want you to see what happens when this guy G-locks. Now, he's not supposed to G-lock but he does, and he G-locks because he's not doing the correct, what are called G-straining maneuvers. And you strain, you contract the muscles in your extremities, you contract your abdominal muscles, you grunt, you grunt, you try to push blood to your head, um, but this guy didn't do it right, and um, he G-locks in the centrifuge. In order to qualify to fly in the F-16, you have to be able to do 30 seconds, in the centrifuge at nine Gs without G-locking, which means you have to know how to do the G-straining maneuver. So let's see what this guy does. Okay, we're looking for that dive Navy sticker. Once you found it and you're feeling primarily straight and level, a couple spins around the room there, uh, let me know, okay? All right, good to go. All right, remember, I'm going to give you the legs breath countdown, 7.5 Gs for 12 seconds, four breathing cycles, we'll be good to go, okay? Whenever you're ready, go on and enable that side stick. Stick is hot. Profile is running. Here we go. Legs, breath. <laughs> Come on, get into it, sir. You're on top. Three, two, three, three. There you go. Max legs, max blues. Count it on your own, sir. There you go. Come on. Keep oh, PG locks. And now as he comes to, he's going to do the funky hey, sir, chicken. Can you hear me? Oh, no! Put your head back, sir. Put your head back. Which everybody can does me, when sir? they come to. Take him two more. Go ahead. Now, what are you going to do if you hear that noise? Okay. How are we doing? Doing all right. Okay. What happened? Uh, I don't know. e -log? Yeah. Ring a bell? Uh, did you have any dreams? Uh, yeah. What'd you dream? I was in a maze. You were in a maze? Okay. Did you get out? No. No. Okay. All right. How you feeling? Feel better. Feel better? Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, stand by just a moment. Now, clearly, they've right, turned so the center for your jaw at this home. point. It's spinning uh, down. The lights will come to a stop. The door will open up. Crew chief will come to get you out real quick. Stay seated and buckled in, okay? Okay. All right. Well, I'll talk to you once we get out of here, okay? So this guy is trying to qualify for the F-18 in the Navy, and he's, that was supposed to be a 7G ride for only 12 seconds, but he G-locked. 
So unless he can find a way to learn how to do this for nine Gs for 30 seconds, he's not gonna be able to fly the high, air, the high um, G aircraft. When our pilot, mishap pilot lost, uh, lost consciousness, uh, he was in what's called a vertical notch maneuver in the low to mid 30,000 foot range. And here's what, a, 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 here's what happens. Uh, we have on our right wing, on our starboard wing, instead of a missile, we have some that looks like a missile, but it's actually a bunch of radios that talk to uh, a very sophisticated uh, computer system on the ground, a series of antennas over the range so that we can simulate missiles firing at us and it is extraordinarily realistic. And in a uh, missile launch, uh, in order to defeat a missile, which is way faster than our airplane, uh, he did what was called a vertical notch in which you dive and you lose about 10,000 feet and you dive fast, you go down an afterburner. And then you pull out hard with a 9G pull and climb, as as vertically as you can it is a very violent maneuver and it will defeat it will defeat a lot of tracking missiles because the missiles have such little fins that they can't make as sharp a turn uh, as the f-16 so our pilot lost uh, consciousness doing a vertical notch from 30,000 feet he lost 20,000 feet and he regained consciousness and did the funky chicken just like this pilot did, they all do it. He regained consciousness and funky chicken at 10,000 feet, nose low and gaining airspeed. Uh, you're, not, you're not really completely yourself when you regain consciousness. Uh, he recovered the aircraft at wave tops, uh, which was uh, very fortunate. He did tell, verbally tell it to the safety chief of the squadron, but said, he would not allow it to be written up and would deny it if the safety chief did write it up. So this was a G-lock that was not actually reported or investigated. Uh, he had a loss of consciousness again two years prior on the flight line while performing his pre-flight. He was then vomited and was uh, agitated. He was worked up and found to have a peptic ulcer. He'd been bleeding into his gut and he had become anemic and so that was fixed and he was uh, did not lose his flying status and oh well, he did initially but then they put him right back once he was treated his 72 hour history he was not home for the 72 hours prior to the mishap flight because he was working <coughs> for his airline as a czech airman one day prior to the mishap flight he told the captain on the aircraft that he was uh, acting as a czech pilot he said he had to be with, to the reserve the next day, but he knew he was gonna be outside of crew rest. And so he called the squadron and canceled the morning flight. Uh, he also tried hard to depart the airline at 1545 hours the day before the flight, but the airline did not let him off duty. So he finished his airline duty at 2230 prior to the mishap flight, signed into the billeting at 2306, and signed into the squadron at 0652. So it was only really seven hours and 46 minutes between signing in the billeting and reporting to the squadron. At best, we estimated six to seven hours of uninterrupted rest were possible. Air Force instruction requires a 12 hour break between duty days and eight hours of uninterrupted rest prior to uh, flying and so he, knowingly violated both the 12 hour break and the eight hour rest as prescribed by Air Force instruction. Motivation, uh, he was a highly motivated guy. In fact, sometimes he was, <laughs> the guys in the squadron said his motivation was a little bit negative. He was very enthusiastic. When he came back from the fighter weapons school, uh, he was telling everybody how to fly the airplane. Uh, he was highly motivated. He elected to fly on the mishap flight day, knowing that his decision was contrary to regulation. His discipline, uh, he was aware of the crew rest problem. He told his airline captain, he tried to get out of his airline duty. He lied to the squadron DO about his crew rest and knowingly violated the AFIs. Uh, 
his judgment was interesting. He willingly violated discipline, flying without crew rest, lying to the DO, didn't allow the GLOC report, um, flight with two unreported losses of consciousness made me feel that his judgment was somewhat questionable, but it really had to do with over-motivation. He was described as uh, jovial and easy to get along with, but also arrogant, cocky, and superior. Now, is this a bad thing in a fighter pilot? No, this is exactly what we recruit for. Because if you're gonna do what we do in these aircraft, you'd better be arrogant, cocky, and superior. You better know that you, are, you own the sky when you are in that aircraft. There were absolutely no instances where his squadron mates refused to fly with him. Um, but he was an aggressive guy. He was trying to lead the flight from mission wing three position instead of being a mission wing one. Um, we did feel, I did feel in the investigation that he was complacent on the day of the flight. He um, did not draw an attack diagram, didn't follow the, the prescribed ingress, did not trail at the prescribed distance. He didn't action right or left as briefed. He released his, earl, his ordinance too early. Uh, he, didn't, he didn't egress normally, which set him up for the near midair that caused him to lose his life. And he was distracting everybody and distracting himself with the extraneous air-to-air -air calls. There was no evidence that he was task saturated. This guy had over 2000 hours in the jet. He was a weapons school graduate. He was distracting himself with all these air to air calls, but he, you know, this guy was a combat pilot. So I, I don't really feel that he was task saturated. Visual issues are very real. In your peripheral vision, your peripheral vision is no better than 2100. Your vision straight ahead has the capability of 2020 vision, but your peripheral vision has no better than 2100 as uh, an option. And I want to show you that if I can. I don't know if I can get back to where you can see me. There we go. Uh, I don't know if you guys can see me. Can you see me? Can anybody see me? Put your thumb up if you can see me. I can see you. All right, what I want you to do is put your finger directly in front of your face and focus on your finger so that you can see your finger clearly. Now keep your finger right where it is, keep your head locked and move your eyes as far over to the right or left, I don't care which way you go, as move your eyes as far over as you can. What happens to your finger? It goes out of focus. Yeah. That's because you're seeing your finger now in your peripheral vision. Peripheral vision is never better than 2100, ever. That's the way we're designed. Peripheral vision is to get your attention so that you go look at the target that's out there. So when he saw this aircraft coming in his peripheral vision, he wasn't seeing it any, at any better than 2100. It was a blur but it was a moving blur that was obviously a threat. And he was startled by this. And his startle response caused him to move the stick in a way that caused his loss of life. Uh, sun, cloud, shadows, and all that other stuff were, it was, it was a cavu day. So um, none of that was a factor. Uh, there were lots of non-contributory issues that I won't go into unless somebody asked me a question. His selection as a pilot, auditory, balance, kinesthetic, insight, learning ability, psychosocial, pathological, pharmacological, and stress. All of these we have to look at as part of the investigation, <coughs> but none of these were contributory. So the bottom line was this was a good pilot. In fact, this was a, a great pilot who was flying a routine mission with no new challenges, but he was tired. He was just tired and it cost him his life. Here's some sleep loss facts. 
if you take experimental rats and keep them from sleeping, they'll die. It takes them about three weeks to die, but they just die. They can't maintain their body heat. They get a fever, they get infected, and they die. If a person loses one night's sleep, the next day they tend to be irritable and clumsy. The next, uh, and sometimes they speed up because they will compensate with epinephrine. A person who misses two nights sleep will have trouble concentrating and makes mistakes doing normal stuff. A person missing three nights sleep actually usually starts to hallucinate. Uh, if you get just a few hours of sleep each night, you incur a sleep debt and it takes a long time to pay that debt back. Uh, a 1997 study found that people who lose sleep, if they restricted their sleep in this study, which they did, they restricted people to four or five hours per night for one week. <clears throat> and it took two full nights of very lengthy sleep for them to recover back to their normal performance. Sleep deprivation in, a, in an army study uh, demonstrated reduced both emotional intelligence and ability to do constructive thinking. Um, loss of one and a half hours sleep results in a 32% reduction in daytime alertness. Now think about that. If you decide you're gonna launch on that cross country and you're gonna get up earlier than usual, uh, you may have lost that hour and a half sleep and you wonder why you feel like you're dozing off when you, you know, get into that first hour of cruise. Um, there is more than double the risk of sustaining an occupational injury if you lose just an hour and a half of sleep. And actually your immune system is impaired. Your risk of infection is actually increased. <clears throat> Long-term sleep deprivation results in a lot of things high blood pressure, increased risk of heart attack, increased risk of stroke, depression, mental impairment. And this one I find extraordinarily fascinating. On your chromosomes, on your cells, in your chromosomes, the ends of the chromosomes are called telomeres. And telomeres shorten every time your cell divides. When telomeres get too short, your cell can no longer divide and that cell dies. So one of the major reasons that we age and ultimately die is because of shortening of our telomeres. Well, that sounds scary, except we actually make an enzyme called telomerase. And telomerase lengthens our telomeres. And so the reason we don't just die all the time from, you know, when we're just kids is because telomerase lengthens our telomeres. Now, if you sleep less than five hours a night, as compared with someone who sleeps greater than seven hours per night, your telomeres are 6% shorter. Why? Because it, loss of sleep reduces the production of telomerase. So you just don't lengthen your telomeres the way you're supposed to. Interestingly, lack of sleep is also a known cause for obesity because we get our fuel from glucose, glucose and oxygen. Our, our cells make uh, the energy molecule ATP from glucose and oxygen. And so if you don't sleep enough and you're tired, what people tend to do is eat in order to increase their glucose so that they can stay awake and working. And they eat a lot because they're tired and it ends up with extra weight. And of course, excess weight is a major risk factor for sleep apnea, which now we're in a vicious cycle because the person with sleep apnea is not getting adequate rest. National Highway Traffic Safety uh, Administration estimates that drowsy driving leads to 100,000 automobile wrecks per year in the United States with 71,000 injuries and 1,550 fatalities. That is just from driving tired. DOT thinks that one out of every five drivers has dozed off at least once behind the wheel. Um, when I was a surgery resident, 
I don't think every, I think every single one of us uh, fell asleep driving at some point. One of our guys uh, had a very serious accident as a result. Scary when you think about 18 wheelers, because a lot of those guys sleep only two to four hours a night. Shift workers, people who have to go from day watch to night watch and back again, are at alarming increase in the frequency of accidents when they switch to nights. The Exxon Valdez oil spill and the Three Mile Island meltdown of that nuclear power plant was attributed to a loss of sleep and on the uh, persons who were the operators. Shift workers are in the top three as the highest risk for drowsy driving accidents. Sleep deprivation is actually used to torture people, to cause them to tell you the truth because it's hard to lie when you're sleepy. Australia has looked at this. Um, there's a very interesting study that they did. They said that staying awake for 17 hours, this is just a normal person who's had a normal amount of sleep. But then when you get up, if you stay awake for 17 hours, that's like just a long day. Their performance is the equivalent of having a blood alcohol of 0 0.05. Now, under the Department of Transportation, if there's anything above 0 0.02 and a person has an accident, they are considered to have been driving impaired. Uh, legally drunk, for, right, for a non-Department of Transportation. I'm talking about non-truck drivers, non-train <coughs> uh, engineers, and non-airline pilots. You and I, who are not DOT, Department of Transportation, that's 0 0.08 is considered intoxication, but it is well known that anything above 0 0.04 leads to impairment. Um, Interestingly, Canada reported that every year when they go off of daylight savings time and everybody gets an hour extra of sleep, there's a fall in the number of road accidents. This is a very interesting in, uh, piece of information. If you have partial sleep deprivation, not full sleep deprivation, just partial, for five nights in a row, three alcohol drinks will have the same effect on your body as if you'd had six. Isn't that interesting? If you have sleep deprivation chronically, and I wish that I could say I don't understand that, but I really do because when I was a surgery resident, we were up every other night for five years. Uh, feeling tired is, you get to, that gets to be normal. Um, but you're chronically making mistakes, and that should scare the heck out of you. Some studies suggest women need up to an hour's extra sleep compared to men, and not getting it may be one reason that women are more susceptible to depression. Isn't that interesting? So summary, sleep deprivation causes a lot of physical problems, a lot of mood changes. It makes you tired in the morning. It makes it harder to communicate impaired attention span, difficulty processing information. And what do we have to do when we fly the aircraft? Well, we have, to, <laughs> we have to process a lot of information and we have to make quick decisions fast. So every one of these aircraft has a question mark on it. So it must be time for questions. May I answer any questions for you? Yeah, and everybody, uh, you're going to have to unmute yourselves, but go ahead and unmute and ask questions. All right, David? Yeah, your bottom left corner, you can unmute and fire off your question. I have, I have, a, question. I have a question. OK. Um, I have found that uh, over the years that my average sleep is and it, it's kind of fallen over the years to about oh six hours six and a half hours a night and mm -hmm. i seem i seem to be okay is that is that is that an abnormal situation or uh, well can i can't that sort of sort itself out and be no i can't see you i i just see your name good uh 
<laughs> so, so I'm going to ask you a personal question. How old are you? Uh, I'll be 80 in three months. That's the answer. As we age, as we age, it is observed that the general population of both men and women sleep for a shorter period of time, which is a kind of a vicious cycle because we know that that also shortens our telomeres and shortening the telomeres ultimately leads to more aging. But it's an observed but unexplained, observed but unexplained fact that the, as we age, we tend to sleep less. And I'll tell you another thing that's really interesting. As we age, we tend to, what we tend to lose is the deepest sleep. When we sleep, we go through four phases of sleep. Well, stage one, which is restored, which is a lot of restorative sleep, but it's right below REM sleep, which is where you dream. And then stage two is a little deeper and stage three is a little deeper and stage four is the deepest sleep. And that's the sleep that is considered to be the most restorative for our brains. As we age and we sleep less, what we tend to lose is that deepest stage four sleep. So it's not, so sleep is not as restorative as it was when we were younger. And we're sleeping less. I cannot tell you why, because it's not known, but it's an observed fact that that happens. Thank you. I wish I had Drew, a I have a question. Yes. Um, what were the, the, the mission pilot, uh, mishap pilots um, uh, duty schedule prior to the incident, we talked about his work as a Czech Airman uh, and the engineer panel. Well, what were his daily, how long were his days and where he, was he sleep uh, depraved before the accident? Yeah, so he was flying normal airline duty days and those are fairly lengthy days, as you know, I'm sure you know. Uh, they were flying full 12 hour days uh, for all three days. So uh, we, we might assume that it wasn't the first night that he was uh, correct tired. But, he, but he, he clearly knew that he was sleep deprived and he clearly knew that he was not within regs. I have a question. How are, how are you impacted um, by napping and sleeping less at night, but napping in the daytime? So napping is really, really interesting. You know what? I don't know if I can do this. I, I, I'm, I don't want to screw up these electrons. They're working really well. So I'm not going to go. I was going to go try to find a slide that I use with my anatomy and physiology students. But when you here you are wide awake. And when you fall asleep for the first 25 minutes or so, you fall down through REM sleep. When REM stands for rapid eye movement. And that's where you dream. It's very restorative. It's very restorative. It's not as restorative as the deep, deep stage four sleep, but it's very restorative. And after about 25 minutes, that's when you fall, start falling very rapidly into stage two, stage three, stage four. So people who nap and want to actually feel better need to take about a 25 minute nap. And I'll tell you that I do that personally with great regularity. I, I set the alarm in my phone for 25 minutes. And so I fall through REM sleep and then I wake back up. It's easy to awaken from REM sleep and you feel refreshed and you feel restored. If you set your alarm for one hour, then you're gonna fall all the way down into stage three or stage four. It's much harder to wake up from there when the alarm goes off and you'll wake up, instead of feeling refreshed, you say, this nap made me feel worse. I, I'm, I'm really dragging now. That's because you tried to wake up from the deeper levels of sleep. So napping is actually in incredibly restorative if you do it wisely and nap for about 25 minutes. You know, uh, particularly since the pandemic and I've been staying home a lot, 
I uh, involuntarily fall asleep <laughs> watching television or whatever. Yeah. I don't have a I don't have a time set or anything. It's just whenever I wake up, I wake up. But then as a result, I'm not ready to go to bed until late at night. Yeah, you're getting your sleep in, in, in bits and starts and uh, fits and starts. And yeah, you, you're going to what uh, is, is well observed. You're going into a 24-hour cycle instead of a day-night cycle. And um, you'll have to, at some point, get yourself back onto a day night cycle when we're all allowed to go back out again. But does this 24 hour cycle hurt anything? No, it doesn't. Tell my wife that, will you? <laughs> it won't hurt him, but it's irritating as hell. <laughs> She's on the line too. <laughs> I heard her. <laughs> can, can you tell us a little bit about uh, melatonin and, and it's uh and it's placed in, as we get older? Yeah, so there's a gland in your brain called the pineal gland. And the pineal gland um, uh, produces melatonin. The pineal gland is sensitive to light. Now you may think that there's no light inside your head, but I demonstrate this with my A&P students. Uh, we have, you know, human skulls and you can hold a bone up and shine your flashlight and it glows. You, light comes through your skull. It is not a you know discrete light. It's not like a beam from a flashlight, but just the light, the skull will glow. Your brain, in a living brain, the cells are virtually clear. When a cell is when you're living, you know when you're dead and you're looking at it on a microscope slide and we've stained it, it doesn't look clear at all. But a living brain is relatively clear. So the pineal glands, which sits in the middle of the brain, is actually light sensitive. And it is what um, the pineal gland, um, in response to light, sets up our normal wake-sleep cycles. It's why you guys and everybody who's staying in the house all the time, and probably with the windows shades drawn, our pineal gland doesn't know what is day and what is night. And that's how we get into this 24 hour interesting nap and awake, nap and awake, nap and awake cycle. Um, the pineal gland in response to light change produces melatonin and melatonin as a hormone circulates. It has a target to many, many of our organs and results in our slowing things down so that we can fall asleep. Taking exogenous melatonin from the drugstore is um, a question to which there is no good answer because that's not human melatonin. It's melatonin from wherever the hell they get it, cows maybe, I don't know. But um, nobody really knows what the dose is for exogenous melatonin. Uh, that melatonin that you buy in the drugstore is not regulated by the Food and Drug Administration. There's no known or tested uh, dose. So it's a personal experiment. Uh, I'm not saying don't do it. Many people do and they do it safely. But um, as a pilot, I would be very concerned about experimenting with something that uh, has the potential to make me drowsy and I don't know how long it's going to last because it's not human melatonin and it's, it's taken exogenously. So you have to decide for yourself whether that's what you want to do. The pineal gland and its sensitivity to light is why time zone change screws us up so much. Uh, every time I had to go from one hemisphere to the other very rapidly uh, on active duty, uh, day night would be all screwed up. Um, when we deployed from the United States to Bosnia, um, which is almost a 12 hour time change. It was just basically changing from day to night. We flew, uh, un, we, f we flew nonstop, air, and air, air refueled and flew nonstop. We were expected to start flying combat missions within 12 hours of arrival. And I went as a flight surgeon and I told the Wing King, we're gonna have some accidents and we need to put two crews on all of the air refuelers so that we can get adequate rest and we don't 
have any accidents. Um, he didn't do that, but uh, we did have three auto accidents in the first 24 hours. And it all had to do with melatonin. Our poor pineal gland says, I don't know what the hell's now going on now. I'm supposed to be asleep and it puts out melatonin. It, in a normal young person, a young person, it takes about 24 hours to adjust to a single hour of time zone change. So if you go 12 hour difference, you go to Europe, it should take 12 days before you're actually acclimated. When you think of the president and the other senior leaders that travel all over the world, what they do is they stay on Washington time. They sleep on, on the aircraft or they sleep where they're gonna sleep and they try to stay on Washington time because you can't, you can't acclimate that fast. Um, and the older we get, the longer it takes for us to acclimate to a single hour of time zone change. I, I, I'm sure everyone in this room knows that it's kind of screws with you when daylight savings time changes. Thank you. Dr. Rizzo. Yes. Please, uh, comment on the COVID-19 situation. I know that's a broad question, but uh, give us a little briefing on the COVID situation. So, I, I read about an hour a day just about this. <laughs> and the information is very um, rapidly developing from the beginning of the pandemic when we knew virtually nothing about this virus. We now know a lot about this virus, but there's still an enormous amount to learn. Uh, this is a new unique virus every year in the world, there are two or three new unique viruses that develop. They almost always come out of China. And there's a very, very good reason for that. I can go into it if you'd like, but they almost always come out of China. Sometimes they come out of the Middle East, but mostly China. And um, the reason that it's so worrisome is that because the virus is new, Human beings did not evolve alongside this virus, and so our immune system doesn't recognize it. And so the virus attacks us without our ability to defend. Now, once it attacks us, our immune system, once if, if we become sick and do not die, our immune system will start to make antibodies against the virus. And so if we're attacked again by this virus, we should be able to fight it off. The idea of a vaccine is to prime the immune system to make antibodies without our having to be infected. So that if we then come in contact with the virus, as soon as it gets into us, pardon me, because we were vaccinated, we will start making antibodies. Um, this vaccine is wonderful. And the reason that it is so good is that it is a, a new technology from the classic vaccines that you guys are aware of. We used to use live attenuated virus. We would give live, we we We'd take live virus, we would change one or two little proteins on its coat and inject it into people. And that's what our vaccines used to be, live attenuated virus. Oh my God, viruses mutate. Sometimes the live attenuated virus would mutate back to what we called wild type and the person got sick. The original, the original polio vaccines were live attenuated virus. And a small percentage of people got polio from that, from those viruses. Then we went to a killed virus vaccine where we killed the virus and injected it. And we hoped that the immune system would still see the viral proteins and make antibodies. And most of the time that worked. But this, this is amazing. This is a little stretch of something called messenger RNA. When our DNA in our cells wants to make a protein, 
And that's the job of DNA, by the way. DNA's job is to make proteins. When DNA wants to make a protein, it makes a little thing called a messenger RNA, and that messenger RNA is read by the cellular machinery and makes a protein, okay? So what they've done, this is just so brilliant. They've taken, they've, they've um, built a little stretch of messenger RNA, human messenger RNA. They built it in the laboratory. <coughs> it gets into your cells and triggers your cells to make one part of COVID-19's coat protein. Just not the whole virus, a little tiny piece. Our immune system sees that little tiny piece and says, yikes, and makes antibodies against it. It's, it's amazing. And the messenger RNA, once it gets into your cell and triggers you to make this little tiny protein, this little tiny viral protein, the messenger RNA is metabolized. It's gone. This is, this is the future of all vaccines. They're all going to be this. But the reason we were able to develop this vaccine so quickly is that uh, there was actually a woman who developed this, this technique several years ago. And she's been making vaccines basically on standby. And we were able to use her technology in order to uh, make this vaccine so incredibly rapidly. It's, um, it's a wonderful technology. Uh, and as far as anybody can tell, you know, we've owned this disease only been around for a little more than a year. So we don't have long-term studies on it because it's, it's only been around for a little more than a year. But as far as we can tell, the vaccine is causing our immune system set, to set up a long-term immunity. So we may end up having to get boosters. We'll just have to see. But um, for now, it's a, it's a, a wonderful vaccine. I urge Oh my God, do I urge you to get it. I have a question, doctor, about, you mentioned uh, vaccine uh, uh, viruses coming out of China. I travel extensively in China on business and I'd be interested uh, why you uh, think that a lot of our viruses come from there and some from the Middle East. Well, I don't think it, I, I know it. And in my previous job as director of the National Center for Medical Intelligence, this was something that we looked at uh, daily. Um, in China, there are over 1 billion, that's billion with a B, over 1 billion people that live with their animals. They live in the same room with their pigs, their birds, bats are in the ceiling. And so all of these animals have their own set of diseases. They have their own set of viruses there's bird viruses, there's pig viruses, there's bat viruses, there's human viruses. And we're all sitting in the same room together if we live in China and we're one of these billion people. Well, I want you to imagine a bird sitting in this room that's got a bird virus and a mosquito bites that bird. The mosquito sucks up some of the bird's blood and now it gets some of that uh, avian bird virus into the mosquito. The mosquito flies off and bites the pig. When it bites the pig, it injects, because when a mosquito bites, the first thing it does is inject saliva. The saliva has a, a, an anesthetic in it, so you don't kill the mosquito, and it also has an anticoagulant so that the blood doesn't clot when the, when the mosquito sucks it up. So the mosquito bit the bird and got an avian virus in it, and then it doesn't have to fly very far. It, there's a pig right there and the, the bird flies down and bites the pig and it injects the avian virus into the pig. Now, most of the time the pig's immune system will kill off that virus, but some of the time, if the pig is also, also infected with a porcine virus, a pig virus, the two viral, uh, either DNAs or RNAs, the, the genetic material from the avian virus and the porcine virus can mix and create a new virus which has never existed on the surface of the planet. 
Now, if the mosquito bites that pig and sucks up that new virus and takes it to, and then goes bites a human, and it injects that brand new virus into a human, well, most of the time the human immune system will kill it off, but sometimes the human has a cold or some other viral infection, and this new virus, which is part avian and part porcine, will also take up some human viral DNA. And now we have a brand new unique virus, which has never existed on the face of the planet, which is got DNA from three different organisms. In the case of COVID-19, this was happening as well as using DNA from bats because the bats are living in the house too. So the reason that it comes out of China mostly is because there's so many people that live with their animals. And two to three brand new viruses that never existed on the surface of the planet come out of China every year. Most of the time, they're not a big deal because our immune systems just deal with them most of the time. But this isn't one of those times. This is a, a smart virus. Have you ever read Matt Ridley's The Red Queen? I have not. It's uh, a number of years old, but his thesis was that since time immemorial, man has been in a war with his viruses. Well, he's not wrong. And I'll tell you something that's really fascinating. If you get the disease, uh, not you personally, because this was, of course, was never going to happen to you, but it, let's imagine that somebody gets the disease of hepatitis B, hepatitis B. Well, hepatitis B is a viral disease and it's a DNA virus. That DNA virus, actually the, the, the DNA from that virus incorporates itself into the human liver's DNA and stays in the human liver for the rest of your life. And that's the reason that the overwhelming majority of liver cancer in the world is from people who've had hepatitis B. Now, you're not gonna pass that on to your children because the DNA virus from hepatitis B infected your liver. But what if we have a virus that attacks eggs in women? Women are born with all their eggs. And if a viral infection attacks their eggs, then that viral DNA incorporates itself into the human egg. And then if that egg is fertilized, that viral DNA is passed on to the offspring, the human offspring. Now, this is not theoretical. The Human, Ge the human Genome Project demonstrates that fully 23% of human DNA your DNA and mine is viral DNA. In fact, the gene for the human to code for a placenta is a viral gene. So we've been at war with viruses, but viruses have also incorporated themselves into our DNA since the time began. This is fascinating stuff. Now, not all viruses are DNA viruses, the majority including this one is an RNA virus. And so that's never gonna incorporate itself into our DNA. But it's fascinating to think about the idea that the human race is actually modified by certain viral infections. Uh, Dr. Rizzo, I had read something here like, like a few days ago that um, the vaccine, the way that they're producing it now, like you were describing, actually started off years ago as, as they were looking for it as a uh, vaccine against cancer? Uh, her initial research was to try to find uh, uh, some way for us to make antibodies against cancer cells. Yes, that's exactly true. I have a... That's on the, that's on, that's still not an impossibility. <clears throat> not with this vaccine. Dr. Rizzo, can you hear me? I do. Okay, great. Well, once again, thank you so much for a great presentation. Uh, Fine, thank you. I, I happen to be the, the fellow who picked you up, my wife and I, when you came I, over to Venice a couple of years ago. 
I remember, and I, I appreciate you. you. My wife and I actually talked about that today. Thank you. Oh, you're quite welcome. But uh, I reti- I've been retired 20 years now. I hate to, it's hard to think of that. I'm here I'm turning 80 <laughs> in three days. But uh, you brought back a lot of memories of, on the subject of fatigue because I retired out of the airlines and flew all over the world in heavy metal. And uh, when I finally checked out as captain, after observing a lot of what was going on in the cockpit, the cockpits that I flew in, I actually, every time, I hate to admit it now, but then again, the FAA can't come back at me. I broke a regulation every time I flew with a new crew because the first thing I told them was, we take naps on the airplane. You were because smart. At that time, I just honestly believed that, and it, the, I flew three man airplanes, not, not, not two man cockpits. I'm an old timer. Uh, I just felt it was a lot better for someone to take a short nap and then be a lot better, uh, a little more awake when it came time for the approach. But uh, your, your comments have kind of, if you will, vindicated my guilt that, oh, you know, deep down, I kept on thinking, was I, was I right? Was I right? Well, I did survive, obviously. You were the captain. You made a yes. captain's decision and yeah. you made the right decision. No, oh, thank you. I appreciate you that. <laughs> How many but thousands that, of passengers did you keep alive because you made that smart decision? I Thank carried you. a lot of cargo too. <laughs> a lot of pigs. <laughs> and I appreciated you too. <laughs> Thanks but for that, doing it. Again, it's good to see you. It's nice to see you too. I see your nose and your mouth. Okay, there's your eyes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, yeah, uh, Dr. Rizzo, uh, for someone that's that's uh, actually being treated for uh, sleep apnea, mm-hmm. what does that do to them as, as they uh, progressively age? Well, it's a great thing to be treated for sleep apnea because <clears throat> this is actually the, the guy who figured this out got the Nobel Prize in medicine about 20 years ago. We didn't know until about 20 years ago that the cells that line our arteries make a gas, and that gas is called nitric oxide. Now, that's not nitrous oxide. Nitrous oxide is an anesthetic agent and a drug of abuse. But nitric oxide is actually produced by the lining of your arteries. Nitric oxide does two incredibly important things. It dilates your arteries. So it increases the volume of blood that goes to your organs. And it keeps your platelets from clotting inside your blood vessels. When I was in medical school, I raised my hand one day and said, how come our blood doesn't clot inside of us? And the answer was, shut up, Rizzo, because they didn't know the answer. (laughs) But but now we know that it's the reason our blood doesn't clot inside of us is because of this gas, nitric oxide. Now, it turns out, that (laughs) this is amazing, of the arteries in your body, the arteries that make the most nitric oxide of all of your arteries are the arteries in the nose. The second is the penis and the clitoris. Erection in both the penis and the clitoris is a result of nitric oxide causing dilation in the arteries and blood flows in. When you're being treated for sleep apnea, you've got your mask on your nose. All night long, you got five centimeters of water of air pressure blowing over those arteries. You're giving yourself an entire night of increased nitric oxide, which dilates your arteries, puts more blood to your brain, puts more blood to your heart, puts more blood to your kidneys, everything. It's amazingly, amazingly good for you. It's amazingly good for you. The sleep apnea who's not treated, they almost always breathe through their mouth because of their, of their airway shape. Because they breathe through their mouth, they don't get the benefit of that nitric oxide that comes from blowing air over your nose. And that's why the untreated sleep apnea doesn't have the benefit of the dilation of their arteries and doesn't have the benefit of extra nitric oxide to keep their blood from clotting, they have a significantly increased risk of heart attack in their sleep. 
So being treated for sleep apnea doesn't matter. As you age, it's actually better and better and better for you. It's not making things worse. It's considerably making things better. I started on a uh, sleep apnea machine, a CPAP machine about five years ago, and I, I sleep like a, like a teenager now. Yeah, yeah, Incredible. and it's because of the nitric oxide. Dr. Rizzo, can you hear me? I, I hear a faint female voice. Um, so you get the vaccine. How long do you need to continue to wear a mask and keep your social distance after you get the vaccine and are you immune? Okay, so everything that I have been able to read, everything that I've been able to read says that after, assuming you're getting the two that are out there now, which means you have to get two different shots. You get the first shot and then something like three weeks later, you get the second shot. I think it's three weeks. I can't remember. I think it's three weeks. Is it three weeks? I think two, two weeks, three weeks, two weeks. I can't. two weeks. Okay. But anyway, you're going to get the second shot. It'll probably take about two more weeks after the second shot before your body is really making adequate antibody to protect you from the disease. In the best of all possible worlds, which I don't know if you've noticed, but this is not the best of all possible worlds, but in the best of all possible worlds, theoretically, you ought to be able to take your mask off and just have your normal life. Now, there's a couple problems with that. And one of them is real, and the other is theoretic, and we don't know the answer. So let me tell you the real problem first. The real problem is, if you walk around without your mask, everybody's going to be angry at you. They're going to say, why are you not wearing a mask? And you need to wear a big pin that says, I'm vaccinated. But, you know, you can probably buy that at the dime store. So, you know, who knows? But the theoretic, <laughs> the theoretic and unknown with this virus, the theoretic problem is that let's imagine that you're fully vaccinated, you make antibodies, you are protected. But when are you going to make those antibodies? You're going to make it when you somebody blows their coughs, their COVID-19 into your oh, nose and oh you inhale God. it. And then you start making antibodies and you don't get sick. But you had to inhale that virus. Now, are you exhaling that virus? Odds are the answer is yes, but nobody knows. No. Nobody knows. And so the current recommendation that I just read this like a day ago, the current recommendation is that we will all have to still keep wearing these masks until we have a huge percentage of the population vaccinated to protect them, to protect people who are not yet vaccinated in case you inhale it and then blow it back out. You inhale it, you're vaccinated, you're not gonna get sick. But you may be blowing it back out again and you're gonna make little Susie or somebody sick and we don't wanna do that. So. That's why people are still going to be asked to wear masks. Yep. No longer for their own protection, which the masks really do help you, but to protect others. And it's theoretic, but we just don't know. This Remember, this is a brand new virus. It didn't exist a year ago. I keep so that's what's going to happen. I keep hearing people say, oh, well, once I get this, I can go back and play bridge, and I can go shopping, and blah, blah, blah. I know. I hear it too. And, but, and maybe they can't, but it's also a possibility that those persons, as they inhale the virus, would exhale it and could potentially could infect somebody that they didn't mean to infect. Yeah. And so until we have a, a significant percentage of the population protected with, with vaccine, I fear that we're all going to be wearing the masks, even though we may be vaccinated. 
thank you. Yeah, that's where it is. Go that's where it's going right now. But please, please, please recognize that this is a brand new virus and new information is all the time. I read it. I read a full hour every morning when I get up on this virus. And it's amazing how the information changes because new information comes out. This is a brand new virus. So we'll see. That's the current. What I just told you is the current information. Could that change next week? Uh, yeah. Somebody may be doing a research project that you and I don't know about that says people who are vaccinated don't exhale the virus even if they inhale it. If somebody shows that, we don't have to wear the mask. But that's not been shown yet. So that's why we're going to be stuck with it. Is there a chance this virus can mutate where the vaccine would not be effective? There's a 100% chance that the virus will mutate because all viruses mutate. But so far, the two major mutations that have, there's already, there's been over 100 mutations of this thing in just a year because viruses reproduce like crazy. <coughs> so they have plenty of, plenty of chances to mutate. But the two major mutations, one from Britain and one from South Africa, have demonstrated that they've demonstrated very conclusively in the lab that the current vaccines are as completely as effective with those mutated strains as with the other strains that we initially had when they started to develop the virus, the vaccine. Is it possible? Not anything's possible, but um, if it does happen, that's when we're going to end up getting a booster. A year from now, if they've if it's mutated so that X percent X percent of the virus is no longer covered by the vaccine, well, they'll you know tweak the vaccine a little bit, and then we get a a booster. It's like you get your flu shot every year. You know, it's because the viruses mutate. Well, fellas, uh, you about ready to wrap it up. We've kept the doctor quite a while, hour and a half now. Uh, I've noticed several chat messages that this is the best presentation. One fellow in, he's seen 85 webinars. This is the best one. Oh my and God. Comments, uh, just, we really appreciate it, doctor. It's, uh, you've hit a home run for us again. Well, you're and so kind. Saying, please invite Dr. Rizzo back again. Well, we will do that. We will do well, that again. I appreciate you very, very much. Thank you. I'm honored and I really appreciate you. Thank you. This is great.